its primary intention initially is to chill free speech, to quiet the proclamation of what God says about human sexuality. You would think that there'd be absolute outrage and resistance everywhere from the church. Unfortunately, the best you get is a couple of limp-wristed articles uh, on the TGC site for the, for the most part. The bill itself would, would seem to prevent an individual from being able to seek out counsel from the Word of God that would help them to understand God, His righteousness, what is required in order to be reconciled to Him. That isn't just sheer wickedness, that's satanic. It is a crime punishable by up to five years in prison to attempt to convert a transgender person or a homosexual. The business of conversion is the reason the church is in the world. This is why we exist in the world. So when pastors knew this law had been established in Canada, they wanted to stand up for the truth of God and let the whole nation know that uh, the church of Jesus Christ will preach the conversion of sinners from every kind of sinful lifestyle, including that one. Church will be the church. Amen. Father God, we, uh, we come to you this morning in trusting that your truth transforms, uh, the truth of your word. And I pray that uh, you would help us in this, in this life and in this constant walk of transformation. Help us to be continually transformed to your image, continually conformed to the image of Christ. Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Truth Transforms, transforming hearts and minds through the truth of God's Word. My name's Adam Markley, and today I've got a compilation for us of sermons that were preached on biblical sexuality. Uh, this was uh, preached on January 16th, 2022, after Bill C-4 in Canada was passed. If you're not familiar, Bill C-4 basically made it illegal uh, to preach on biblical morality, to preach the clear truths of Scripture, uh, starting in the very beginning, like Genesis 1-1, that God made them male and female, meaning transgenderism is not a thing. It doesn't exist. And uh, what Christians believe and have always believed is that men are men and women are women is considered hate speech in Canada. And if uh, someone is to, a pastor is to uh, try to counsel someone out of their false feelings of believing a man believing that they're a woman or a woman believing that they're a man, uh, that is now illegal in Canada. It's also illegal to uh, counsel someone out of same-sex attractions that they might have, uh, realizing that that is not consistent with being a follower of Christ. And so there was a call for many pastors to preach on this subject on January 16th. So I've got some sermons here ready to play. I've got uh, a short little interview as well. Uh, this interview is, comes on Cross Politic by Joe Boot, who is a pastor in Canada, very familiar with what's going on. Then there'll be a sermon played by James White. He is an elder at Apologia Church in Arizona and uh, was one of many pastors, 4,000 plus, I believe, in America that preached on the topic, and many in Canada, and many, uh, hopefully, many other parts of the world. And then there's James Coates, a pastor in Canada who also spent time in prison just for shepherding his flock, just for keeping his church open and following the commandments of God. He's already spent 35 days in prison, uh, as the tyranny continues in Canada and continues to spread around the world and into the United States. This is not something that is restricted to Canada, mind you. 
Uh, this is going on in Indiana as well. The same legislation is taking place there. Uh, we will move on to Pastor John MacArthur. Uh, it will be the last uh, sermon that you will see on here. Dr. John MacArthur, pastor of Grace Community Church. He's the one that, uh, um, well, James Coates forwarded an email from somebody else. and uh, Somebody forwarded an email to James Coates. James Coates forwarded an email to John MacArthur and said, hey, can you make this happen? Can we get a bunch of pastors to preach on this on January 16th? And he did. And so that's what we have. Uh, and that's what is available for you right now. So if you're not familiar with what's going on in Canada, uh, then th certainly this will help fill you in. And uh, we need to stand with faithful men who are preaching the word of God. So here they are. Yeah. So, so maybe with COVID, okay, let's just say that I could see some of the pastors in Canada seeing COVID and just saying, now, you know what, we're going to follow the guidelines. We're not going to make a big fuss about this. And some of the churches out there that decide to stay open, they want to separate themselves from them because, you know, you guys are just missing it on this. And there isn't any clear admiration, a, a, a teaching on scripture about how to handle COVID. Fair enough. But conversion therapy, every church in Canada has to be flipping out about this one. No, this is clear. This is right at the home of their counseling, their Sunday morning services, the their gospel. every Tuesday Bible studies, everything that they do, that they're called to do, and calling men to be men, women to be women. This is right at the heart of their message. Every church is flipping out about this right now, right? <laughs> well. <laughs> Stop. You, you, would, you would hope so. Um, you would think so. Uh, but tragically, that isn't the case. In fact, there were regional bylaws to this effect in different provinces already. This is a federal bill added to the criminal code. So this is the government taking out the biggest stick that's available to it, the criminal code. But there were already bylaws in various provinces. And gents, I had already had requests from certain churches before I came to speak, even if I was just using a church building for a conference, to supply my notes and my PowerPoint in advance so that it could be scrutinized to make sure the church wasn't going to fall afoul of one of these local bylaws. Wow. Uh, so that's already, that's already happened. Um, no, for the most part, uh, churches and church movements are relatively quiet on this. We have uh, launched, as you probably know, a, a campaign. The Ezra Institute um, recommended to a group of pastors that we we have a, 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 an annual anniversary preach on the, the Sunday following the passage of this bill into law to preach on biblical sexuality. Um, and uh, we do believe that several hundred churches are going to be participating in that this coming Sunday Good. to preach on biblical sexuality, which is uh, something. And Liberty Coalition Canada advocacy group that um, got started last year has been promoting that campaign. And actually, you Americans, our American friends, uh, are much quicker to pick up on that and, and start running with it. You would think that there'd be absolute outrage and resistance everywhere from the church. Unfortunately, the best you get is a couple of limp-wristed articles uh, on the TGC site for, for the most part. Now, there are some faithful pastors quietly getting on with uh, being faithful and and there may be many unsung heroes in in quiet corners out there but in terms of the public witness um to to stand publicly against this is to experience a certain degree of a significant degree of isolation even in the church you've got some churches who say well we've got to go a third way or playing it down and saying this isn't really going to be an issue don't worry the homosexual minister who who happens to be promoting who promoted this bill and, and advanced it uh he doesn't want to go after churches i mean here's the uh, here's the thing they couldn't produce any evidence that these so-called coercive practice were, practices were happening anywhere in canada this <laughs> bill was never targeted at some maverick therapist electrocuting people in his basement right. uh <laughs> for for you know for their sexual orientation this uh, is targeted specifically at the Christian world and life. Yep, it's targeted yep, at Christian right. pastors and churches and counselors and those that are trying to help those with these problems, these struggles, trapped in these sins. We are participating as a church with many other believers across the United States, Canada, I would hope in the United Kingdom and other places. In speaking today on one particular subject, 
and that is God's law in regards to human sexuality. Now, I do not have to tell anyone in this room that over the past literally two decades, a revolution has been taking place in Western culture. And we have been saying for a long, long time, if it keeps going this way, eventually governments are going to criminalize the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people are saying, no, no, no. I have before me the text of Bill C-4. Now, what is astonishing to me, and most of you probably are aware of this, but not everyone has been keeping up with this particular aspect of the news. This piece of legislation was brought through the Canadian legislative branch unanimously. Not a single person stood up to say no. It was met with applause when it was passed by unanimous consent. It is a criminal act. A, this, is a, this, is a, this is not civil code in the sense of, well, you can sue somebody if you don't like what they said, that type of thing. This is part of the criminal code. And under the preamble, whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because, among other things, it is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. Did you hear that? When you look at this bill, it only precludes seeking to help someone who does not want to experience homosexual desires. It only precludes seeking to help someone who maybe has begun the mythological act of transition but now wants to go back. There is nothing in this bill about the other direction. This is the enshrinement in the legal system of, this, of the state of Canada, the nation of Canada, of this idea that heterosexuality, that saying that that is good, that that is normal, that's a myth, and it harms people. How did a nation that began with Christian symbology and Christian common law come to a point like this, and so swiftly. You can face up to five years in prison in the nation of Canada now for seeking to give counsel to someone who comes to you and says, I don't want these desires that I have toward people of my same gender. Five years in prison. And if you leave the nation of Canada and go to another nation so as to obtain the same kind of counsel or, say, bring your children to obtain that kind of counsel in another country, when you come back, you can be arrested under this law. That is how radical, how evil, how tyrannical this law is. Now, most of my Canadian brothers 
are probably not facing immediate arrest today for the sermons that they preached. But I guarantee you one thing. Every single pastor in the nation of Canada that this morning opened this book and read any number of passages, whether it's 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, 1 Timothy 1, 10, Romans chapter 1, maybe from Leviticus 18 and 20, Genesis 18 and 19, every single pastor that did that, the thought crossed his mind. Is there one in this congregation who is going to be the one who is going to be calling the authorities this afternoon? Every single person thought of it, I guarantee you. Its primary intention initially is to chill free speech, to quiet the proclamation of what God says about human sexuality. And not a single person in those legislative bodies had the temerity to stand up and say, this is wrong. And you and I both know there are all sorts of those very same types of people in our legislative bodies here in the United States of America who would dearly love to see that same kind of legislation taking place here. And back at that particular point in time, I kept saying that the homosexuals do not want equal rights, they want uber rights. They want supremacy. They want to silence any criticism. And we warned back then, they're going to demand to have marriage. Oh, come on! 2015. And right now we're sitting here going, you do realize that there are more and more articles showing up saying that pedophilia is likewise just an orientate. You do realize, no, 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 it'll never happen. Give it five years. Give it five years. What happens to a nation that indulges in the violation of the good gifts that God gives to it? And so... You look at both our government and nation, and you can only conclude one thing. The wrath of God is being unleashed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Our government and nation are under the judgment of God. When Bill C-4 was passed in Parliament, our elected officials cheered and celebrated giving hearty approval to those who practice that which they know is worthy of death. All the while putting legislation in place that potentially shuts those individuals off from the, the saving and transforming message of the gospel. The bill itself would, would seem to prevent an individual from being able to seek out counsel from the word of God that would help them to understand God, his righteousness, what is required in order to be reconciled to him. That isn't just sheer wickedness. That's satanic. Our government needs to repent. The wrath of God right now being revealed from heaven against our nation is a down payment on the wrath to come. You know there's a wrath to come because his wrath is already at present active. And our government is storing up wrath for themselves in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to their deeds, Romans 2, verses 5 and 6. This is not a game. Politics is not a game. 
The decisions they are making as politicians are on record. They're in God's book. Unless they repent of their sin, that book will be opened and they will be judged according to their deeds. And as those who are propagating evil, they have a compounding condemnation because they are involved in in furthering the depravity of the the people of their nation by putting in place legislation that that celebrates and, and protects individuals from being confronted with the reality that their sin is going to lead them into the judgment of God. And so this is the revelation of God's wrath. And it's expressed in stages. And the first is sexual impurity. Sexual impurity. Look at verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. When this takes place, sexual sin begins to run rampant. Immodesty and sensuality are glorified. Entertainment becomes increasingly sexualized. Self-gratification is celebrated. Pornography becomes prevalent. Fornication, promiscuity, increase. Adultery destroys marriages. Homes are broken. And society begins to unravel. And it's important to note at this point in time that this is heterosexual sin. This is heterosexual sexual sin. It's important to recognize that because sexual sin is sexual sin regardless of whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. All sexual sin is sin. And in the first stage of a society being given over to its depravity, you have sexual impurity that begins to come out into the open to be accepted socially, to be celebrated even. And the reason is stated, verse 25, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. So suppressing the truth, suppressing the the knowledge of God within man results in exchanging the truth for a lie. And once that happens, a society and nation have pulled up anchor and begin to drift out into the sea of complete and utter depravity. And what starts out as a sexual revolution progresses into a homosexual revolution. This is the second stage, verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural or against nature. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function for the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And so just as a a nation given over to lust, fornication, and adultery is evidence of the wrath of God and his judgment on a nation, so too a society given over to homosexuality is also evidence of the very same reality, evidence that a nation is under the judgment of God. And you might be wondering, why is it that a a rejection of God in this way, suppressing of the truth, a refusal to acknowledge him as God results in, in being given over to sexual sin because sexual sin is so destructive to human flourishing. If you want to destroy society, all you need to do is let sexual sin run rampant. 
And because they refuse to honor God or give him thanks, he hands them over to the, to the depravity that's already there in their heart. Removes his restraining grace. And so you have a sexual revolution, you then have a homosexual revolution, and yet it doesn't stop there. From there, it progresses to a depraved mind. The third stage, verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. And there's a play on words here. The LSB translates this, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to an unfit mind. And this is where good is evil, evil is good, light is dark, dark is light, sweet is bitter, and bitter is sweet. This is where you begin to look at the world and, and look at what you're seeing in the world and look at the thinking of the world and you are, are, are struck by how absolutely insane it is. Logic, rational thought, basic common sense, incredibly scarce. In some cases, it would appear that People lack even two brain cells that actually connect each other. <laughs> Meanwhile, the logic, rational thought, basic common sense are incredibly scarce. Lunacy, folly, and utter insanity are in abundance. But the unfit mind doesn't just fail to reason properly, it results in doing that which is unfitting. Rest of verse 28, to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent or violent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. That describes our society, does it not? And verse 32, although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Again, they know. They know the ordinance of God. The LSB calls it the righteous requirement of God. They know. And the requirement is this, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They know. And yet they not only do the same, they give hearty approval to others. Here, the, the Apostle Paul writes, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous do not go to heaven. In fact, let me just say this, good people don't go to heaven. I mean, the fact of the matter is there are no good people. None of us are good. No, not one. Good people don't go to heaven. Good people go to, go to hell. Good people and the unrighteous are the same category. The unrighteous don't go to heaven. But who are the unrighteous? The unrighteous are those who haven't received as a free gift of God's grace a right standing before God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because they haven't received that righteousness, they live lives consistent with unrighteousness. And that, right, that, that unrighteousness can manifest itself in a plethora of ways. The unrighteous are those who come into the world, as we all do, conceived in sin and enslaved to sin 
who then, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, begin to pursue all kinds of sexual immorality. And not just sexual immorality, but all kinds of immorality. And that pursuit is the byproduct of a, an internal problem whereby there is a corruption within that must be addressed in order for one to be, as we've seen, delivered from the wrath to come. And so the unrighteous are those who need internal transformation. A transformation that takes place inseparably from being given a, a right standing as a gift of the grace of God. And so Paul poses a very obvious question. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he goes on to delineate expressions of unrighteousness. Conduct that is a reflection of unrighteousness. Conduct that, that characterizes the individual because their conduct defines who they are. And you see this in the rest of verse 9. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Not an exhaustive list, but these are examples of the kinds of lifestyles that result in one not inheriting the kingdom of God because these lifestyles are evidence of unrighteousness. Now you'll note that in this list you have fornicators. Fornicators are heterosexual. Fornicators do not go to heaven. You have there also adulterers. Adulterers are heterosexual. Those whose lives are defined by adultery do not go to heaven. You also have there the effeminate. That refers to the passive member in a, a same-sex relationship. They don't go to heaven. Nor homosexuals. Again, sexual sin. These individuals do not go to heaven. And really at this point in time, it must be said that to convert a person from homosexuality to heterosexuality accomplishes nothing apart from a person coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ whereby they receive internal transformation in accord with the, the righteous standing which is a gift of God's grace. Becoming a, a heterosexual doesn't bring anyone any closer to the kingdom of God. Heterosexuals and homosexuals alike are all going to hell without the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so Paul is highlighting those kinds of lifestyles, examples of conduct and behavior that, that renders one unrighteous and will ultimately result in them not inheriting, inheriting the kingdom of God. And it needs to be said at this point as well that even homosexual desire, just as adulterous desire, it's sinful. It needs to be mortified. It needs to be turned from. There's no such thing as God saying it's okay to have homosexual desire within that you just don't act out upon. No, the desire itself is sinful. To look at a woman with lust is to commit adultery with her in the heart. The, the desire is sinful, tantamount to the physical act itself. But 
But now for the remedy, verse 11. Such were some of you. Now that language there, such were some of you, refers to a state of being whereby a person's conduct is a a reflection of that state of being. And the sum there is not to say that there are some in Christ who who aren't fallen, sinful human beings in need of the grace of God, that that this is a, a contradiction of the statement that Paul made in Romans 3, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul is simply saying that there are, there are some in Corinth who, who don't necessarily fall into one of the categories that the Apostle Paul has just described. They fall into another sinful category. And so Paul says, such were some of you. Some of the Corinthians were fornicators, some were idolaters, some were adulterers, some were effeminate, some were homosexuals, some were thieves, covetous, Drunkards, revilers, swindlers, such were some of the Corinthians. No doubt, such were some of you here this day, but you were washed. The washing being described there is that washing that takes place in accord with regeneration, where the Spirit of God brings new birth to the fallen human heart and and replaces the the heart of stone and and grants a heart of flesh that beats for God, where there's the the, the sprinkling of water and the, the cleansing of water that takes place metaphorically in regeneration, new birth. And this cleansing results in a, a cleansing of all defilement of flesh. And so such were some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, which is to be set apart from sin and set apart to God. But you were justified. A declaration by God whereby he declares the sinner righteous on the basis of faith, whereby he imputes the righteousness of Christ to the sinner by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And it says there, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Who is it? that accomplishes the work of conversion. It's the Holy Spirit. Surely the government is not attempting to outlaw the converting work of the Holy Spirit. And so this is the remedy. This is what all of us need. All of us need to be washed, sanctified, justified. We need new birth. The sinner who wrestles with certain sexual sin wants to say that they were born that way. And in a sense, they were. They were born dead in sin. And yes, they they have a degree of freedom to select among the panoply of sinful lifestyles, that lifestyle they want to be enslaved to. But the, the reality is the sinner does not need to change their desire prior to coming to Christ. They need to come to Christ to have their desires be changed. They need the spirit of God to transform them within, to grant them a new heart that desires righteousness. They need to come to realize that their conduct is sinful, that their sin is first and foremost against God, their creator. And then they need to to look to Jesus Christ, the one whom the Father sent into the world to accomplish salvation and redemption and believe on him and be saved. This is what every person is in need of. And so when it comes to the whole issue of conversion therapy, the bill doesn't really bother me a whole bunch at all, apart from the fact that they're labeling biblical morality myth. But no, I, 
I don't practice conversion therapy. I don't even know what conversion therapy is. I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. I point them to mercy and forgiveness. I call them to repentance. But I can't bring about repentance. I can't convert anyone to Christ. That's a work of the Spirit. Only He can accomplish that work. You know, our Prime Minister declared on the heels of the passing of that bill that he had the back of the community that, that this is supposed to be protecting. This bill is not loving to that community. To shut them off from the saving message of the gospel is anything but loving. And the harm and difficulty that that community goes through is horrific. They need grace, mercy, compassion. They need to know that there's, there's forgiveness at the cross of Christ. They need to understand that there's, there's transformation in the gospel. But to shut them off from the one thing they need is anything but loving. And our responsibility is to stand on the word of God, uphold biblical truth and biblical morality. The gospel is at stake And so we're going to preach the word of God. And we're going to call sinners to repentance and entrust the converting work of the sinner to the Holy Spirit and do so to the honor, glory, and praise of God. As you know, we have uh, joined with some of our brothers in Christ to address the issue of biblical sexual morality on this particular Sunday because the new law went into effect in Canada, Bill C-4, which basically made it a crime uh, to offer to a transgender person or homosexual person any kind of conversion therapy. It is a crime punishable by up to five years in prison to attempt to convert a transgender person or a homosexual. The business of conversion is the reason the church is in the world. This is why we exist in the world. So when pastors knew this law had been established in Canada, they wanted to stand up for the truth of God and let the whole nation know that uh, the church of Jesus Christ will preach the conversion of sinners from every kind of sinful lifestyle, including that one. So, so uh, James Coates got a hold of me and said, would you join us? And I said, of course. And so that led to the emphasis today. And uh, we have been joined by about uh, 5,000 others who have uh, sort of signed up to support this day in that way. And obviously the objective, of course, is that the church is called by the Lord to convert sinners. That's, um, I mean, that's His work, but we preach the message of conversion by which the Holy Spirit does that wonderful miracle. And verse 12 sums it up. O oh, my people, their oppressors are children and women rule over them. Their oppressors are children, childish, weak, effeminate, and women rule over them. And those who guide them lead them astray and confuse the direction of their paths. Sin destroys people, yes, it also destroys nations. And this nation and any nation that makes laws to protect sin is on that same path to total destruction. Sin destroys, I'll say it again, individuals and it destroys nations because it invites down on its own head the wrath of God. Romans 1 tells us what that wrath looks like. God gives the nation up 
He gives them up to sexual immorality, Romans 1, 24. And then He gives them up to homosexuality, and then He gives them up to a reprobate mind. You go from sexuality, a sexual revolution, pornography, to homosexuality, to insanity. A reprobate mind means you just you don't even function. You can't. There's no way back because you aren't rational. You start making laws to protect people who are insane. Why do you say that? Because they don't know whether they are male or female. How insane can you be? That becomes in itself a judgment. So we know how God feels about the transitional transgender movement. We know how He feels about homosexuals. Is there any hope? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 6 and we'll wrap it up. 1 Corinthians 6, this is the good news, verse 11, such were some of you. Is that good news? Such were some of you. Right there in the Corinthian church, right here at Grace Community Church, I know personally people who have been converted out of every one of these categories. In this church, I've been here half a century, I've seen it all, and that's our mission. And people have asked me through the years, well, why don't you get out of California? Because this is where people need to be converted. Some of you, he says, All of you really were outside the kingdom of God, alienated, hopeless, sons of hell, children of wrath. But you were washed. You were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Amazing statement. And he uses three words to describe it. It's such a thorough conversion. This is not therapy. This is not a process. This is a divine event that takes place in a divine moment. It's something that had already happened to them. It wasn't in process. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified, a decisive event in which God washed you, sanctified you, and justified you, the hopeless sinner. Three words. First of all, if you're a sinner, you need to be washed. It's a compound verb. Washed thoroughly, washed down to the bone. Deep cleaning. No matter what the category of your sin, you come to Christ and you will be washed. Then you'll be sanctified. Once all the filth is washed away, the Lord will plant His holy presence in your life. And then You'll be justified. He will declare you righteous. You say, well, how did I get righteous so fast? Because God will credit to your account His own righteousness. That's conversion. That's that's why we exist. And no government will ever make any law that will stop the true church from being in the business of converting sinners. And you can be washed 
which includes complete forgiveness. You can be sanctified, which includes being a new creation, becoming holy, as it were. And you can become justified in not a process and not a therapy. It's a divine miracle. When you trust Christ, trust in His name, and it's the work of the Spirit. How dramatic was this conversion? Go back to chapter 1. We'll end there. How dramatic was the change? Chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. What? Did those effeminate, transgender, homosexuals, revilers, slanderers, perjurers become saints? Yes, that's how complete the conversion is. It's a divine, miraculous transformation. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, whatever your category of sin, Christ can convert you into a saint, washing all the filth away giving you a holy new life and covering you with His own everlasting perfect righteousness. That's the message of the gospel. It was some years ago that I read Psalm 107 like I did this morning in a service here and um, just read it. and. As it turned out, there was a gentleman sitting back here in that area, and he told me this afterwards. When I read that, he was so excited by what he heard when I read the part about how God would lead you in a straight way. His name was Robert Lagerstrom. He was one of the leaders of the Hollywood Gay Pride Parade. He had been told he was dying of AIDS. He didn't want to die. He was terrified. He said to some of his homosexual friends in Hollywood, where can I go? I'm afraid to die. Where can I go? They told him, go to Grace Community Church. That's, that's the truth. He said, I came to Grace Church my first Sunday. I sat there, and you read Psalm 107, and you read that God could break the, the iron bars and the bronze gates and set me free. And when I heard you read that, all I wanted to do was run to you, and you just kept talking. <laughs> and then people sang, and then you took an offering, and then you kept talking, and finally you said, Amen. And I came flying to the prayer room, and he was converted that day, totally transformed. And he happened to live on the, pari uh, the Gay Pride Parade route, which was not long after that. And he opened his home for everyone to stop by and gave them the gospel. I baptized him right here. He lived for a few months and He went to heaven. That's why the church exists, so that sinners can be converted and enter the kingdom of heaven. Any government that stands in the way of that work of God is in the most dangerous position that anyone could ever be in on this planet far da more dangerous than any human enemy or any virus or any other conceivable threat is to have God come down in judgment. 
church will be the church. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching. I do hope that was a blessing. Uh, if you did appreciate that, be sure to like it, share it with others, and uh, hit that subscribe button if you're on YouTube. You'll be notified of new videos whenever they come out. And God bless you. Have a great day.